Christa, hello. <laughs> well, this is an extraordinarily uh, auspicious occasion, of course. I've always watched uh, Ted online, you know, spent hours drifting away on these ideas worth sharing, and I, I'm not quite sure if I'm completely up to, the, up to scratch with this idea, so I start with a disclaimer by Chuck Palahniuk that says, I'm not original, I'm the combined efforts of everybody I've ever known. And so in that Ubuntu-esque spirit, <laughs> what I'm actually saying is that uh, if today doesn't go well, it's as much my fault as yours. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and none of the ideas in this uh, talk is original. I find originality highly overrated. <laughs> and it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy way out of any kind of like copyright infringements. And the, I was so overwhelmed by the idea of this, and I've been working so hard at so many things that I sort of tried to get out of this in many ways possible. And I never sent the emails, but I spent a large part of yesterday typing these emails that were <laughs> kind of lies to get out of this talk. <laughs> And uh, I don't know why. I think it's because people I really respected probably recommended me to come up here. And what I've seen today was such noteworthy and such passionate and such extraordinary people share their ideas about the city. And I've done the same in different forums, you know. Uh, I think I've been endowed with a really big mouth. And uh, in that sense, uh, I felt the pressure all the more to uh, perform today. And I mean, it's ultimately about this city, but my experience, like every single one of our experiences here, is so unique. <laughs> I find the city quite scary, and uh, I find it an overwhelming place to be. I've spent probably the last 15 years of my life always returning here, you know. There's a dynamism that draws me, and there's a kind of tension in that that I find very exciting. And maybe at the same time, like I say, a bit overwhelming. So I've spent time in many different corners of this place with many different hats on, you know, as a consultant in the creative communications industry. I've gone from mall to mall creating desires in all of us for things we don't really need, right? And I'm typically to be found on a weekend going from Santon to Rosebank to whatever indoors air-conditioned public space I can find. And I've consulted in many of these symbolic reparation projects, these temples of the empire that shoot up to rewrite history, right? Rewrite history through text panels in a country where we have serious literacy issues and there's no public engagement with the communities around them. But I was there and I coined it and I was a consultant changing the face of Joburg's history, impassionately kind of carrying the cause and really in that yuppified state thinking I was making a huge difference, you know? And then also really can be found on weekends hipsterizing it like up with like a very expensive coffee in any one of these inner city rejuvenation nodes and these extraordinary new places popping up all over the city, which at the end of the day and to some extent seems to be just a, a bit of a battle between two Jewish developers in the city, you know? <laughs> and I... <laughs> As much as I respect their efforts, I'm often left at a dislocated space because I've done community engagement projects. I've subverted public space and I allocated that funding and it was me, me, me doing all these different kinds of things. And when I open the door in my Yeovil home, I'm just confronted by a real alien experience most of the time. It's, who are these people around me, you know? It's so easy to have these invisible walls all around us, and I don't understand this pan-African cosmopolitan teeming mass, you know. Put the uh, dirt in the bin, you know. Stop stealing my uh, bry for scrap metal. Um, <laughs> why am I having these conversations at every dinner party, and what are these strange things? And I kept thinking, what are these strange encounters? And, if you look at the city like an organism, like as if it's a living, breathing, teeming, live thing, the thing I found most profound, of course, is that I am that little bit over there at this point in time, or I was at least, hopefully it's shifting. I was this sort of like cholesterol-filled artery <laughs> nodule, you know? Just earning my 30 to 40,000 rand a month, you know, and then creaming it for the rest, and with a lot of opinions about how to engage the city 
and how to get the public engaged in it and not to work from the top down but from the bottom up. And then putting these projects together that have a flash in the pan in that space and I started suffering from a bit of compassion fatigue <laughs> which essentially means, ugh, get away beggar and drive on. I had a bit of option paralysis, you know, another antique store, another little something. You can get things really cheap in Joe, but you can go to the Mooty Market, have your owl stuff there, take it back to your old home. And then at the end of the day, a real case of douchebagitis, you know, which is not uncommon. And spending, spending the weekends having huge conversations about nodes of development and interactive activation of public and private space interaction <laughs> in the nodule, and then at the same time moaning about the fact that, hey, sitting at the dinner conversation, probably half of the people there have been hijacked in their time in Johannesburg. Most of them have had some kind of violent incident, and a lot of them are going, are we going to stay here? What's the future of South Africa? generally dealing with that kind of thing. And the most amazing thing happened to me, the most amazing thing, my car was stolen. <laughs> Believe it or not, the vintage Mercedes was stolen from the neighborhood I live in. And all of a sudden, I was really forced to confront a new reality, sitting. And for me, there's something really liberating about that, because in a way, I call it the Joburg tax, right? So I'd never been robbed, I'd never been hijacked, I've never had like a smash and grab, so now is the time my car was taken, I can relax. <laughs> Nothing else really bad is going to happen to me, you know, and I couldn't believe that it had happened. Sitting in my office at work, can't really drive anywhere, really irritated with my colleague, and too proud to ask him for a lift to the Woolworths. At the studio, <laughs> there was an electric bicycle. The client had dropped it there, he said, develop the brand for it. Something extraordinary happened, and I feel a bit like a broken telephone every time I s recite this little part of it. But the first thing that happened is that I got off my behind, from behind my computer, and I got into a different mental and physical gear, right? I just, for the first time in the day, I was actively engaging, engaging myself physically. The second thing that happened, of course, was this and I'm really passionate about this aspect of being uh, part of cycling culture, is this idea that I became slightly more sensitive to the environment around me. It's like with your walking tours, Gerald, you know, that immediate sense of connection. For Brian's idea of the street level engagement, you know, and I always see it like a sea anemone in a pool, slightly low when it's low tide, and as if there's fresh water coming in, and all those feelers come out. And for the first time, I saw a tree at the end of Susman Road, where my offices were, that was double the size of this building. And I'd driven past it twice a day, maybe four times a day, every day, for two years. And it was the first time I saw it. And the third thing that happened on that fitful and amazing, oh, fateful, and <laughs> <laughs> fateful, a fateful ride was that I started connecting with people that I uh, no, would never have. And I see this all the time in my new profession, you know, when you start engaging things on street level through non-motorized transport, things shift profoundly. And so from this uh, ululating, amazing, uplifting experience that I had, <laughs> I decided to put a bit of metal in it and realize that it's about connecting people, places, and passions, you know. And this was all with the branding and business cap on that these ideas came to me. And it translated into developing a completely new way of working. And it actually went as far as me leaving that creative industry and that type of profession to become involved in a full-time basis with this new idea of psychology and promoting a life on two wheels, which is very much built on a manifesto, which when I read it, others have said it sounds like praise poetry, so it might be good to get the professionals in to read it for me. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. There's a couple of highlight ideas in there that I always like touching on, and the first is expand your horizons and arrive somewhere new. The second idea is move, always move, keep on moving. The manifesto is very long. <laughs> but with that as a starting point, really putting the nuts and bolts together to become a psychologist. To take what I've experienced in that brief moment that gave me respite from my cynicism and find ways of actually getting more people into that space. And the stuff that a psychologist does is, you know, arriving somewhere new, developing routes that people can take, non-motorized transport routes and then specifically cycling routes, 
touring experience, generally adding experiences to those rides on bicycles. And sharing the ride, of course, you know, creating activations <laughs> and putting people on this fleet of electric bicycles. You charge them in the flag for three hours, you can go 65 kilometer range. And in that moment, which is always very profound for me, having to confront something so simple. And that's every time that I take somebody out, out on a bike, I have to confront the fear that they have, because the chances are they haven't been on a bike since they were 16, you know, for most people that I take out. And when I do it, and I need to calm myself, because I'm like, oh, she is actually going to fall, oh my goodness. <laughs> I take myself inside, and I remember that <laughs> moment in Bloemfontein, opposite this dusty falky where my mom just let go of the back of that bicycle. And that incredible sense of freedom and liberation that I felt at that point in time. There's a free-rangeness about this. There's a going off the grid, which I think is real beauty. And building community. So, created a little um, pop-up retail and exhibition space, because I come from that environment, and I love giving creative people the opportunity to develop interesting representations. We call it window. We hosted a variety of projects from the sort of like really stock staple important bicycle portraits projects, which is an investigation into the social reality of cycling in South Africa. Right through, that is Stephanie Baker. She's in the Bicycle Portraits Project. She's 85 years old and she rides a bicycle in Pretoria every day. To artist, a musician, and general cross-disciplinary savant, Ivan Lotz, transformed the space into a slightly more subtle creative space. So trying to find those alternative ways of getting people engaged in the idea of cycling. And then, of course, playing the game, going to those meetings, which is about non-motorized transport in the inner city of Johannesburg. And you'd be surprised to know how much is actually going on once you can wade through the very well-balanced activists on the one side with chips on both shoulders <laughs> to the extremely exhausted and frustrated, bureaucratically hangstrom uh, people who work in the city. And uh, there's so many things happening in this realm, and I can't wait for the inevitability of the fossil fuel prices to take us all here, yeah? To, <laughs> to have us all engage from the ground up. And uh, perhaps there's opportunity for us to really do it locally at some point in time. So I guess I'm going to sort of quote uh, Mikhail Corville Anderson, who's this mega bicycle activist in Copenhagen, um, this isn't his quote, but he says, the bicycle is a tool to open up spaces. And I think everybody here is particularly passionate about leveraging that space. And this idea that the bicycle is part of a new mentality that moves away from old value systems, that condones dependency, waste, inequality of mobility, and the daily lack of access. By the way, I still have a car, and it's a guzzler. But we're moving towards these, these things. No matter which way you look at it, <laughs> it's an old cheesy refrain, but this is a good idea. And the only way you're going to understand it is if you make yourself vulnerable enough to keep sane, keep happy, and really engage and try this. Try cycling. Try substituting functional journeys in your life within the city with alternative modes of transport, even if it's walking. So... I guess uh, Albert Einstein is a really big inspiration because he thought of the theory of relativity while riding his bicycle. And he said, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you have to keep moving. And I think there's something quite beautiful in that. I think you'll agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.